Have you got your Bibles this morning? If you don't, we do have scripture that will be on the screens today. As we're continuing in our study on, we're back today on the dawn of justice. We've only got a few more in this series on the book of Judges. But today we're dealing with Judges 16 and we're dealing with the subject, Every Christian's Kryptonite. <laughs> hey, Y'all know about Kryptonite, don't you? You know, as far as the movie Justice League goes, Superman, I think, is probably the most popular member. For years we have watched the cinema and we've heard about Superman. Superman is known as the Man of Steel. He's described as being faster than a speeding bullet. He is also uh, more powerful than a locomotive, and he's able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Does that sound like some of you guys this morning? <laughs> I don't think so. His power includes the ability to fly, and uh, he has x-ray vision that can see through brick walls and all kinds of things. He has superhuman speed, and he has superhuman strength. So Superman is quite a dude in the movie industry, and it will appear from the cinema that Superman is invincible. I mean, he has no flaws, no problems. But there was one weakness of Superman, and that is that green mineral called what? Kryptonite. Contact with kryptonite would render Superman powerless. All his power went out the window. Well, in a similar way today, every Christian, regardless of how devoted we may be to the Lord, has a form of kryptonite that we must resist also. No, it's not a green mineral. But, uh, but the one thing that will destroy your life and the one thing today that will render you and take away your effectiveness to live for God is the kryptonite called hypocrisy. We heard that phrase, terminology, hip, 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 hypocrisy, but do we really understand what it means? Hypocrisy gives you the sense of living for God, but you really are not. So hypocrisy will justify the presence of sin in your life, so it seems like, well, sin's no real big deal. Well, let me just tell you today, sin is a big deal. So hypocrisy allows sin to do the maximum damage in our lives because we refuse to deal with those sins that we encounter day in and day out in our living. So such was the case in the life of Samson. You know, he really started well, but he was marred by hypocrisy. And Judges 13 is Samson's godly foundation, we will call it, a great beginning good parents, had all the things and the qualities in his life to make him strong and usable for God. In Judges 14 and 15, we find Samson's gullible folly that in Judges 16, then we find is his great fall. So seeing this, we see that he started well, but he didn't finish well. So we need to be warned that sin today can wreak havoc in a Christian's life and if we're not uh, careful, you know, uh, we think sometimes we're the exception to the fact. No, we're all vulnerable. We all face the fact that sin can place its grip on us and destroy our lives. Hypocrisy will destroy your best efforts to walk with God. See, we don't walk in the flesh. We walk in the spirit. And, and we've got to be controlled by the spirit. So hypocrisy can destroy everything that God wants you to become. And you know what? God has just, there's limitless things that God can do in your life. But you've got to meet the condition of his word so God can work in your life. So how can we protect today uh, our Christian walk from this process that is called hypocrisy? Well, i got about three things I'm going to share with you today. One is the possibility of sin is deceiving. Uh, don't ever think that there's no consequences for a rebellion. You think, well, preacher, I, I committed sin and... I claimed 1 John 1, 9, and I got my sins taken care of, and so that took care of everything, right? It took care of your sins, but sins bring with it consequences that we have to deal with. And so the consequences then remain. There's consequences for a rebellion. So Samson lived with the thought that with his strength, 
he could overcome anything. He thought, man, you know, with all I have done and the might that I've got and the strength that I have in my physical body, man, there's nothing that can destroy me. He killed a thousand men with a jawbone of a donkey. That's pretty potent. Uh, that's a pretty powerful man. He killed a lion, and not with a stick and not with a gun and not with a knife. He killed it with his bare hands. That's a pretty powerful man. So Samson thought he could live however he wanted, do whatever he wanted, live any way he wanted, but we're going to find out that's not the case. Genesis, uh, Judges 16, 1 says, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. I'm going to tell you, Samson had a bad taste in women. <laughs> I mean, he really did. He had a bad taste in women. Gaza is the most important Philistine city. The Philistines were not the friends of the Jews, and it's in the very heart of the enemy territory. Listen, you can't hang out in the devil's territory and come out unscathed. He is going to have an influence on your life. So Samson had no business being there, but the hypocrisy thought, his, his hypocrisy thought he could handle it. He thought, I am strong. It's no big deal. I can take care of this. Well, this man of God named Samson today who professed to know God, yet he is living now in sexual immorality because his desire with Delilah was not a pure desire. So permit me to give you some stats. One half of evangelicals say sex does not have to be restricted to marriage. Well, I beg your pardon. Have you read the Bible? Amen. I mean, there's things called fornication, that's sex outside of marriage. There's adultery, that's sex inside of marriage, but not with your mate. And it's wrong. It's sin. Church said amen. amen. So World Magazine reports 80% of U.S. teenagers claiming to be born again agree sex outside of marriage is wrong, but yet 66% of them will violate uh, their belief. <laughs> so if you say you believe this and you don't practice it, then what are you living in? Hypocrisy. So sexual sin will affect you. It affects your mind. It affects your heart. It affects your body. And what it actually does, it will destroy people's lives. So while this is happening, Samson's enemies are plotting to kill him. I mean, he's in the enemy's camp. And he is not welcomed with open arms. He is not their friend. And he is in a place where it's going to wreak destruction. Going to verse 2 of Judges 16, and it was told the Gazites saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed in him, him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night saying, in the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. Now Samson is, is in Gaza and he's there for not on business, he's there for personal pleasure, yet his enemies are ready to destroy, are ready to kill him. Going on to verse 3, and it says, And Samson lay, lay, uh, lay till midnight, and arose at, it rose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city, this is how strong he is, and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them to the top of an hill uh, that is before Hebron. So when the moment of confrontation came, we see Samson overcame them with his great strength. Yeah, I mean, he's a pretty bad dude. And he didn't go to Gold's Gym to get his muscles. Uh, you know, he wasn't pumping iron and, and eating a low-calorie diet and all this other stuff. I mean, he was just strong. He was a mighty man. So Samson had his hair uh, dedication, but, you know, he lacked heart dedication. As we all know from the story of Samson, the word tells us that his strength was in his hair. But understand, his heart was not right with God. See, you can have everything going for you in your life that you think is good. You can have all the money. You can have all the prestige. You can have all the power. You can have all the wealth. You can have all everything. Prominence, you name it. But if you don't have God, you are missing the most important thing in your life. So Samson had it on the outside, but he lacked it on the inside. Verse 4 said, And came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorak, whose name was Delilah. 
Samson was a he-man that had a she weakness. <laughs> yep, bad news. Been a lot of downfalls with bad choices. So Samson had a bad taste, as I said earlier, for women. He did not make good choices. Verse 5 says, And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means he may prevail that we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. Well, they bind her off, right? And so uh, a deal was developed with Delilah that if she would find out the secret to Samson's strength, then she will be paid a large sum of money. So in verse 6 through 20, we find a deadly game then ensues that she is trying to find out where is this guy's strength coming from? And she's doing it because she knows she's going to get paid richly for her what she's going to do. So Samson will be deceived by the possibilities of sin. So Samson believes sin cannot touch him. You know, sometimes we think sin can't touch me. You know, I, I, I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray. You know, I, I, sin can't touch me. Let me tell you what, that quick you can lose your testimony. Amen. You've got to be on guard all the time. So Judges 16, 16, 6 and 7 says, And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green uh, um, wicks, yeah, that, <laughs> that were never dried, I had a word misspelled, then shall I be weak. And be as another man. Well, Samson knew Delilah was working on, working with the Philistines. And this is really wild. He knew she was working with them to destroy him. And so he plays the game. We, like Samson, foolishly ask, how close to the edge of sin's cliff can I get? I mean, we take it right up to the edge, don't we, sometimes? Folks, if you've committed sin already in your heart, in your mind, you've already committed the sin. Amen. So when we all, what we ought to ask is, how far can I get from it? You know, the Word of God says, flee the presence of evil because it will destroy you. So going on to verses uh, 8 through 10, Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green wicks, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber, and she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson, and he break the wicks, as a thread of tow is broken when it toucheth the fire, so his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightiest be wherewith thou mightiest be bound. She's whimping and crying and snotting and trying to get his attention, and, and that's uh, So Samson keeps playing the game with Delilah. Let me tell you what, you can't roll the dice with the devil and win. Amen. So going on to verse 11, and he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that have never been, were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. So first it was ropes that had not been dried. Now, secondly, it's the ropes that have never been used. So verse 12 says, Delilah therefore took new ropes, bound him therewith, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there, I mean, how dumb can he be? And there were liars in wait, abiding in the chamber, and he break them from off his arms like a thread. Now this is really actually quite foolish. For the second time she asked Samson, How can we destroy you? I mean, uh, that's like putting bullets in the gun for your enemy to shoot you with, right? So we would think Samson would wise up and say, listen, this is not the place I ought to be. I'm out of here. I'm going to get on my, my moped, and I'm going back to where I should be. Amen. So <laughs> maybe he was on a Harley. I don't know. But verses 13 and 14 says, And Delilah said unto Samson hitherto, Thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest, now listen to this, 
If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web, and she fastened it with the pen, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he wakened out of his sleep and went away with the pen of the beam and with the web. Now, Samson's getting closer to his secret. Before it was dried ropes, new ropes. Now he's getting to the element of his head, and he's getting close to where the secret lies. So that, that, that is the way sin does. She kept persisting, didn't she? And you know, sin does the same thing. It will continue to progress against us, getting closer to the deception that is trying to grow in our lives. So from the dried ropes to the new ropes to the hair, which is a vivid picture of how Satan will try to destroy and overcome you. You've got to resist the devil. Amen. But understand, in order to resist the devil, you must do what James said. First, you've got to submit yourself to God. See, in your strength, you're no match for the devil. I don't care how big and bad. I don't care how good looking you are. I don't care where you've been and what you've done. It makes no difference. The fact of the matter is, you and I are no match for the devil. So you're not strong enough to fight the devil and win. Now, there's only one man who fought the devil successfully, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm glad to tell you this morning, he did win. And because he won, we now are winners. Amen. So it's only when we are in Jesus Christ that we're able to overcome uh, the wiles of Satan and all his devices that he tries to use against us. So what happens is Satan seeks to devour you. He wants to destroy you. Jesus said the thief. The thief is who? Satan. He comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's his method. He's not after the world's crowd. He's out to destroy your testimony, ruin your life. And I'm going to tell you something. When you lose your testimony for the Lord, it's really hard to get it back. So you've got to do what with your testimony? You've got to put on the whole arm of God and guard your testimony. So Samson thought it was no way that sin could affect him. He thought, with my strength, man, there's nothing that, that can come against me and I not win. So Samson gets bolder in his rebellion. Now what happens is this. When you first deviate from God's command, there is a conviction. See, that's, that shows ownership. If you can sin and get by with it and not feel any conviction, something's wrong with your salvation. Conviction is the process that God has put in us that is a red light when we've committed sin. We feel that presence of wrong in our life. The second thing is there's a tenderness today in your heart. See, that tenderness is where the conviction comes up and says, what you've done is wrong. It's not pleasing to the Lord. And then third, there is a guilt in your consequences or in your consequence. So the guilt brings about, is brought about by the conviction and by the tenderness of your heart. It, you know that you have done wrong and that you have violated God in his word. And so therefore, all these things are processes. And like I just said, if you can sin and not feel any of this, conviction, tenderness in your heart, or guilt, something's wrong with your salvation. But every time you take another step away from God, guess what happens? You get bolder in your sin. You get a little bit closer to the edge of that cliff. So God's delay, hear this, God's delay in your punishment is really God's mercy to give you an opportunity to repent. And God wants you to repent. And the only reason that you can repent is because of the mercy of God. So however sin is, is, is binding, it's blinding, and when you commit transgressions and iniquities and sin against God and, and nothing happens, don't ever think that God condones your sinful behavior and that God was looking some direction, other direction when you sin. God sees it all. I mean, there are billions of people on planet Earth. He sees the sin of every person. He knows the heart of every person. You cannot live any way that you want to live. If you are born again, blood-washed child of God, you are to live by the principles and the precepts of God's word. That becomes your chart and compass. So the people had mercy, you know, for 100 years. God, I mean, basically, God gave them mercy for 120 years in Noah's day. But God, 
came to the point of judgment and he shut the door and the day of repentance departed. I'm telling you that the day of repentance is going to be departing from planet earth in the future. People are sending away that day of grace. Now let's, let's go on. Round four now. We've had the ropes and we've had the, 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 the locks in his hair. Now we go to verses 15 and 17 and she said, uh, 15, 16, 17. And she said unto him, how canst thou say I love thee? Here you go, buddy. She turned it up now. She has turned it up a notch or two. When thine heart is not with me, you know, you don't love me. If you love me, you would do such and such. You never put a condition on love. So thou hast mocked me these three times, and thou hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart and said unto her, Thou hast not come uh, there hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. The possibility of sin is deceiving. Now, notice what happens in verse 16, 18 through 19. So when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up, come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. I mean, what else was there? <laughs> then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in her hand, in their hand. And she made him sleep upon her knee. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Samson has gone to the devil's barbershop. And it's cost him a whole lot more than he wanted to pay. Don't be deceived. Sooner or later, the consequences of your sins will fall on you. Amen. You cannot play the sin game and win. Folks, listen. Listen. You, you can't have a church life and a secret life. You know what you're in here, what you're like in here should be the same way you are every day. Amen. You can't have a double standard. You can't say, oh, well, I love Jesus on Sunday and live like hell the rest of the week. I mean, now, who do you belong to? And you've got to ask that question. And so if today, yes, thank God for conviction. Thank God that he will forgive us. But understand today, folks, you can't play games with God. I mean, if you're born again, blood a child of God, then bless God, live like it. Be the person that God's called you to be. Stop living substandard to the blessing. You're robbing yourself. You're literally robbing yourself of what God wants to do because God's not going to condone. God is not going to bring blessings to you if you're living in sin consistently and constantly. So you've got to get right with God. So you can't live in rebellion against God without paying a price. You, you can't hide behind the sin of hypocrisy and live a double life or a double standard in your life. Let's go to the second thing because time's flying. The pattern of sin is destructive. You know, sin slowly wreaks havoc in your life. It just keeps gnawing and chipping away at your life, at your integrity, at your testimony, and it will seek to destroy you. Verse 20, and she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he was, wist not that the Lord was departed from him. That's a terrible thing and a terrible place to be. The power of the anointing of God has been lifted. Folks, that leaves you even more vulnerable to the attacks of Satan. Samson didn't know God's presence was no longer in his life. He thought he could just go out and, and go right back into what he was. The only thing worse than drifting from God is drifting from God and not knowing it. 
And see, that happens in the lives of Christians every day. The sins that we commit, we're literally drifting from God and we don't recognize it. Those little things that start to happen, those little sin practices, those things of missing the, the house of the Lord, and the things of stopping to read the Word of God, and stop praying, and stop focusing, and stop seeking. And see, it's just not something you got up one morning and said, hmm, I think I, today I'm going to jump right back into the pool of sin and live like hell. You didn't do it that way. It was a gradual, subtle process that slowly and methodically Satan just kept putting out the breadcrumbs and leading you away from the table of the Lord. And that's his deception. And this is what he will do to draw people away. Because you know what? He does not want you to be blessed of God. He does not want you to have the anointing of God on your life. He doesn't want you to have a testimony for the Lord because if he can swoop in and steal that testimony and come in as a thief and a robber and rob you of God's power and presence in your life and what he does, just like David in Psalm 51, what did David say? Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. See, all of a sudden your joy has gone out the window. You're just not the person for God that you used to be. Folks, I tell you, it's a big price to pay. You've got to guard your life. Samson thought he knew how to play the game and win. Well, as the old saying goes, he rolled the dice and it came up snake eyes and it bit him. Could that be our lives sometimes? We're playing with the world. We're dabbling with sin. We're doing things that we know that are contrary to God's word. Folks, you know if you sin or not. I mean, we have enough discernment to know what's right and what's wrong. God says, I've given you a free will. Now, what are you going to choose? See, when you choose the wrong way, you choose a lesser way. When you choose a high, God's way, you choose the high way of blessings and integrity with God. So you go through the motions and you don't recognize that God's presence is even gone. You're just going through, well, you know, I still go to church, you know, and, and I still have the Bible on the seat of the car. I bring it into church. <sighs> you're living a lie. And you're robbing yourself of the blessings of God. So God didn't call you to go through emotions. God's called you to be on the front line and serve him. If God's presence is gone, it means that God's power is gone out of your life. You don't have the power of God on you any longer. So sin will drive a wedge between you and God, and this is what we know as hypocrisy. Don't confuse a Christian's routine for a Christian's real relationship with God. I go to church like I was telling you. Well, I, I mean, come on, preacher. I show up here. Showing up is not going to make the change. It's when you decide to crown Jesus first in your life. When you submit yourself to his leadership. So, see, it's not based on a routine. Well, I say my prayers every morning. I pray over my food. I do all these things. Yeah, but you know, if you're not involving God in your life, you're just going through an empty routine. God is not a routine. He is a relationship. Amen. Verse 21, but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Now the consequences of his sin shows up. When you count sin... The cost of sin, it's going to cost you everything. And it's going to cost you your life, your testimony, your effectiveness for God. Sin does not liberate, sin enslaves. And none of us have reached the pinnacle that we are so above sin that he can't touch us. One swoop, one enticement, one lure, one thing that Satan brings into your life can bring you down. Amen. If you're going to live the best life possible, then you've got to give your life to Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about lip service. I'm talking about foot service. I'm talking about living it. So God's word is here to protect us from the blinding and grinding 
uh, and, and the things and the power of sin that Satan will try to put upon us. And I have never met a sinner that is happy because they're addicted to sin. Oh, they may be some form of happiness temporarily. But understand, if you're living for Jesus and sold out to Christ, you're not living from occasion of happenings to bring happiness. You're living in the joy of the Lord. And listen to what the joy of the Lord does because the joy of the Lord is when we're sold out to Christ. That's what Nehemiah was talking about because he said the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's what holds me up. It's what gives me the power of God in my life. See, friend, here's the deal. Hypocrisy is a high price to pay. It's a terrible price to pay. Third thing is simply this. The price of sin is deadly. When sin has run its course in our life, it brings about death. Judges 16, 22, and following Samson, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all this. Samson finds forgiveness in his actions. God is going to use Samson again. Hallelujah. But the consequences of his sin remain. See, this is where we're missing it. We've got 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. He will do exactly that. But it does not remove the consequences that go with the sin. It does not remove the fact it brings a payday. And so realizing this, yes, God will forgive you, and hallelujah for the mercy of the Lord. But remember, when we purposely and, and, and consistently can habitually commit sin, it's going to bring a price tag of consequence. So God's going to use him again, but these consequences of sin are going to have an effect upon Samson's life. God's forgiveness can immediately wipe all sin stain away. Aren't you glad of that? But it doesn't necessarily take the consequences away. So realizing that today, Judges 16 and 22 says, Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Now, this was a word of hope that God wasn't finished with Samson yet. You may have sinned, and it's not the end of the road. God can forgive you. God can restore you. God can bless you once again. But understand, you got to come back to the God of your salvation and seek his forgiveness. You may have blown it in your life. And I would probably dare say that every one of us in here have someplace, sometime in our lives. But thank the Lord that God has not written us off and is finished with us yet. So, you had better take a look at 1 John 1, 9, as I said, but also apply it and seek God's forgiveness. Now, let's read a little bit more, 23, 24. Then the Lord of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. For they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands, our enemy, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. Now listen, does your life cause others today and other people to worship Jesus Christ or to make fun of Jesus Christ? Because I'm going to tell you, the world's waiting for you to mess up. Your unsaved friends are waiting for you to mess up. They're waiting for you to drop your standard of living. They're waiting for you to get on a banana peeling of sin and fall flat on your face. And I'm going to tell you, the world doesn't come along and say, let me help you up, brother. Now they walk by and laugh at you. But I'm glad that we got a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm glad that we got a God who will forgive us. I'm glad that we got a God who will restore us. I'm glad a God that will revive us. I'm glad that we've got a God on our side that does not walk away and say, forget you. I'm glad that we've got a God that loves us with an everlasting love. So Judges 16, 25 and on, you see how God used Samson again. I mean, he brought down the pillows and he said, just to a lad, take me up and let me just feel the pillows that, that hold this place up. And I'm paraphrasing here. And he wrapped his arms around that and he felt the power and the strength of God come back into him. See, there had been some repentance going on in Samson's life. 
God richly. I've heard people say, Samson committed suicide. No, he didn't. He didn't commit suicide. God used him to bring the final victory. Amen. And so he used him in his last moments to do what he was born to do. Because if you'll go back to the original story in the book of Judges of Samson, what was the calling of God on his life? To destroy the Philistines. And God used him to do that. See, the, 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 the consequence of prolonged sin can be deadly. It's far better to get the sin out of your life. So none of us are invincible. So what's the final message, Pastor? What's the final word in this study this morning? Walk with Jesus daily and protect your Christian walk. Just stay with God. You don't have to sin. You don't have to commit today those atrocities of sin that the world dangles before you. I'm glad today God's put a two-letter word in our vocabulary that we can use against every enticement of Satan, and that word is no. And as I've said before, no is a complete sentence when it comes to the devil. Amen. Let him know that no, you are not the servant of sin. You are the servant of the Savior. And your life is dedicated to Jesus Christ, and you're going to live for the Lord because he is your help. He is your help. He is your everything, and you'll never fail with Jesus. Amen. So walk with Jesus, and I tell you, it's the only way to go. It's the only walk to have. It's the only life to live. Let your life reflect the glory of Almighty God. And the church said, Amen. thank you, Father, for a season and a time in the Word. Thank you, Lord, for your Word that we can find people like Samson in that are examples of what we can be and what we shouldn't be. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you for your restoration. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. And thank you, Lord, that we can learn from these characters that we have been reading about, the judges in the book of Judges, and we can learn how that we can live a richer and fuller, more fuller life for the cause of Christ. Now, bless today this church, its people, Thank you for the season and the word. And we pray, Lord, as we enter into a time of worship, of music and praise and, Lord, in preaching, I pray today the mighty spirit of the Lord will be so prevalent, so real, and so permeating in this place that it will overwhelm us by the grace of God. Have your will in your way here today. And we declare, great is our God and greatly to be praised. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's servants said a hearty amen and gave a hand clap of praise unto the Lord.